Good evening, friends. This is Monday, April 20th. We are in the latter part of the month, and here in Denver, it is, has gone from a snowstorm last week to in the mid 60s and full on spring. But that can change any moment, we know. Springtime in the Rockies. My name is Kama Hamilton Morton, and I am the senior pastor of Grace United Methodist Church in Denver, South Denver. And we are on Facebook, Denver Grace UMC, also on YouTube, same name, Denver Grace UMC. Um, and we're on our website is Grace for Denver, Grace the number four Denver.org, which we're working on getting updated a bit with all this new electronic stuff. Oh, breathing deep tonight. I am surrounded by outside on our balcony. Doug um, installed new outdoor Christmas lights. We have had a tradition the last few years in the about we've had a balcony um, since we moved. Uh, let's see, we were in Billings since summer of 17 and we've enjoyed putting the lights outside year round and they uh, are a way to just uh, enhance our little living space and bring some light into the darkness sometimes. So this night we are in the second week in Easter. Easter being a season of 50 days which unfolds with stories of life and death and new life and um, doubts and incredulity and um, confusion and stories of people encountering resurrection in ways that they can't always explain and don't always get. It's very much like us in our lives. And so I begin tonight by lifting up some realities as we think about life and uh, illness or uh, trouble or sorrow that, uh, and death that impacts every one of our bodies at some point. Tonight I lift up in prayer uh, our bishop, Karen Olivito, whose mother died today. And, and another part of the country, another part of the continent. And so we lift prayers for her and for her wife, Robin, and their extended family at this time. In our congregation here at Grace, at Denver Grace, we have lost our first parishioner to COVID-19. Uh, Ron was a gentleman who had been coughing and um, went into the hospital and on his 82nd birthday was given the diagnosis. And for 23 days, he uh, fought in the hospital um, through different stages and was finally determined that he needed to go to hospice. Thank goodness for hospice. I don't know if you or your friends or loved ones have ever had to encounter a hospice care or home care or um, staff or to be in a facility, but it is just an incredible gift to our state of being when we when we are in need of comfort and reality and space that is held so we can process deeper things in our lives. So Ron was blessed to have a couple, couple, three nights, just over two days in the hospice center before he died. So our deep prayers in our congregation for his wife Eunice and their family as they move through this time of death in the season of COVID-19 and what that means for honoring one's life. And what do we do now and what do we wait and do later so that we can truly honor um, our loved ones in community as we would like to. So many families across our country are having to ponder that or deal with that in their own discernment and so it is one more part of this pandemic season that is not normative, 
you know, death is hard enough sometimes uh, for families, for individuals to process. But when you're, you have parameters around you that restrict you from doing certain things to honor, that makes it uh, more challenging. So as we breathe deep this night, may we lift up any of those in our midst, those we know, those we don't know, who are in that place from life through death to life and what that means and feels like in this time. I'm also reminded just to lift up those who are working on the front lines of the healthcare and the medical systems for us all. Um, they're exhausted. They don't have the equipment they need. I have family members that are in the, and dear friends that are in the system and to hear say, we don't have the masks we need. We don't have the equipment we need. So my prayers for safety and wholeness as they encounter the everyday of being with patients and being with people who are scared and not well and what that can lead to. So all kinds of things, you know, we're in the season of Easter and new life and yet in the midst of life there is death. That's scriptural and that's, that is so such a deep reality for us and we're not always good at talking about it. Um, but may we in this Easter season ground ourselves in our mortality and in our connection and in ways that we can um, acknowledge that relationship to each other and, um, and to God. And so this evening I'd like to share Prayer from this is from another guide to prayer book I've been referencing a couple of these this is called a guide to prayer for all God's people it's maroon little paperback that I've had and so I lift up these these words tonight oh Jesus who called Lazarus from his tomb and presented him alive to his friends call me I pray, call me from the tombs which seek to stifle the life I have. Call me, I pray, from the tombs which seek to stifle the life I have. Remove from me the grave clothes which yet hinder my free movement in your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. That just struck me this evening again with images of, of life and of death and of the things. What are the tombs that stifle you this night? This place that you find yourself in your life or in trying to connect with others or in moments or relationships with anger or um, finding yourself unable to let go or to forgive or to receive forgiveness. What are those tombs that bind you? What are those grave clothes that are still clinging to you this night? Might there be a way as we breathe through the blessing of this night and as we pray for rest, might we find a way to shed the grave clothes and to enter into life anew tomorrow? That would be my prayer for myself as well as for you. And so I um, was thinking too about this living and, and how we approach our lives with each other and how we talk about life and faith. And I um, found a reading that kind of struck me again you know I'm usually when I'm preaching I'm preaching to myself <laughs> and talking about uh, salvation and the word salvation it's one of those words that in America is so baggage laden and in fact a lot of times I don't it I don't use it easily because it's so laden with assumptions of what it means but if you uh, if you think of salvation that root of salve Salva. What does a salve do? A salve provides healing, protection over a wound that it may heal. 
And so if we think of that concept of salvation that is, that is lifted up in the scriptures as a, a way to uh, protect our wounds in our lives and to bring us healing, that salvation is, is a healing and a wholeness that we may strive for in so many different ways. And sometimes I don't even know what it is I need healing from. Sometimes I just need to give it to God, to the universe and say, take it, receive it. I can't do it by myself. You know what I need. You know the depths of my, of my innermost being and I need to just lay it down and give it to you. So I found this reflection. This is actually, um, written by John Wesley, who was the Anglican priest who founded the Methodist movement. And so I would uh, share that as well tonight. So he says this, he says, I've always dreamed of solitude, the hermit's life, a cabin in the woods. Oh, sorry, wrong one. That sounds good too, but that's another quote on another thing. This is from John Wesley. He says, by salvation, I mean, not barely, according to the vulgar notion, deliverance from hell or going to heaven, but a present deliverance from sin, a restoration of the soul to its primitive health, its original purity, a recovery of the divine nature, the renewal of our souls after the image of God. True religion is the loving God with all our heart and our neighbor as ourselves. And in that love, abstaining from all evil and doing all possible good to all persons. One of the things that John Wesley is known for and one of the reasons his movement, uh, the movement of the early Methodists just took off like wildfire, is that he was known as a practical theologian. He was very academic, very, I mean, he, he was a reader and, and very well steeped in the classic education of, of college and university and uh, theological training and other things. But the way he lived his uh, theology was on the ground with real people, with people who were not uh, deemed available to come into the doors of the church. And so he went out, he left, left the church walls and went out to them. He would leave the uh, beauty of the churches in his area in England, the Anglican churches, and he would go out into the fields and to the mines and he would engage with people, the poor and those who were working hard just for their sustenance and he brought to them a message of grace, that God's grace was available even to them. And for this, he was um, not always well received in, in the church, and he became, he began gathering people together in small groups, and they, these small groups of people would come together and hear the scripture and pray and lift up each other what was going on and they would ask each other how is it with your soul and they expected you to be honest and they talked about backsliding that's a great word isn't it backsliding so um, you know how some weeks you just feel like yeah I'm on the path I'm doing the best I can okay here we go and then the next week you you know we take a step back <laughs> we have to keep working on it that's the journey of life so I appreciated that reminder of that sense of salvation is not, don't concern, it's not just about who's getting into heaven and who's not. That's not the point. The point is the he the, that heaven is coming to us and that we are called uh, to live it out as agents of Christ's love. And so uh, may we do so. So may we rest this night. May we lift up those who are sorrowing in the depths of grief or loss, and may we uh, breathe deep the power and presence of God's Spirit that we may face a new day tomorrow to be 
a part of that salvation, to be a healing presence, to be a healing word, to be uh, a, a healer of ourselves and of others through our words and our actions this day. And so, as we breathe deep and pray and embrace the enfolding night, I'm just going to uh, sing, a, there's a prayer called the Kyrie Eleison. If you're from Anglican or Episcopal or Catholic liturgies, or it's a popular Latin phrase, Kyrie Eleison. It was a very popular um, pop song by Mr. Mr. Kyrie, uh, but this is not, it means, uh, Lord have mercy, Kyrie Eleison, Christe Eleison, Christ have mercy. And in one of our little supplements in the those in the Methodists, it's in our Black Faith we sing. They took a, a famous classical tune and and put this uh, ancient prayer to it. So as we prepare to go forth, hear hear this prayer. <sighs> Kiri. Christ, have mercy. May you receive mercy this night. May you receive the blessing that you need to help you rest into this night, carrying whatever burdens you have, whatever stresses you have lived through, whatever uh, snippiness that you have uh, shared that you feel badly about, whatever self-imposed notions of failure or success or I didn't quite get that done or I didn't quite do that right. It's okay for tonight. May the spirit of creation of our loving God come into your body and your cells and your brain that as you rest this night you may be woven back together you may receive that salvation, that healing, that balm for your spirit, that you may wake refreshed, ready to uh, face the gifts and the challenges, the opportunities and the blessings that we may find tomorrow. Go in peace. Good night.